The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello there, everybody. My name is Andrew Hamilton, Senior Application Specialist with TransFinder Corporation. It is about the time for our presentation to begin today. We're going to give about uh, 60 seconds for some folks to continue to come in. Uh, so we'll be starting at about, uh, looks like uh, 102, and uh, I'll be back with you then. So we'll be starting shortly. Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, New York State Best Practices Navigating Uncharted Territory Caused by COVID-19. This is the third part of our ongoing webinar series, uh, TransFinder presenting in partnership with uh, uh, NIAPT. Uh, my name is Andrew Hamilton, as I've said before. My, I am the application specialist, uh, senior application specialist with TransFinder Corporation, and I'm going to be uh, in our go-to webinar control panel here, keeping an eye on our questions section. Now, you may be able to hear us out there, but uh, we're not able to hear you, so please use the questions section of the go-to webinar control panel to communicate any questions you have for our panelists as we continue on with today. And we'll see about uh, responding to your uh, questions. And we'll also keep an eye on that uh, section there so we can bring it up to our panelists, just in case the general discussion does not address what you have to ask. So I wanna say welcome to everybody there. I'm going to turn it over at this point. We'll start off with a few words from uh, the president and CEO of TransFinder Corporation, Tony Civitella. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, the rainy weather here in Albany, New York. Uh, but uh, I think based on what's going on, it's okay. We could handle the rain. Uh, it's not snow, though, right? I think some of you guys probably still seen some snow in uh, throughout New York State. But again, welcome to everyone. We're excited uh, to really be really keep communicating with each other about what's going on. And this is really uncharted territory. No one asked for this, and uh, we're but we're I know we're all stepping up to the plate. We're excited to be here. The third one, and so thank you, Andy, for uh, recognizing our third and a NIAPT uh, webinar as part of our best practices series. Today, we're going to have some great panelists. Really, at this point, we're talking about what's next, what happens. We've been all living this new normal for several weeks, and all the school buildings have been closed. So now we're talking about what happens at this point, what's the next thing here. So what will happen when a lot of these um, schools come re back on reopening? Of course, we know a lot of our clients have been really busy on, on really going above and beyond in their communities of delivering food. Some of you actually bring in homework to kids' school, uh, their house, even Wi-Fi. And even I love the parades that I've been doing. A lot of our clients are asking us for helping them on doing these parades to make sure they wave at these uh, to the kids. And some of our clients are even putting up posters and really lawn yard uh, lawn signs to recognize the seniors which really cool things but again we're now shifting all our eyes are now at this point are toward reopening schools right this is a big thing about what's going to happen how about social distancing on, on the bus in the classroom i've been hearing this non-stop in the past couple of weeks you know we know about how we have to disinfect the buses and all these things how about making sure these sick kids are really don't come into school we always talked about that you know saying hey you know, my kid would come home, my wife and I say, oh, he's sick, oh, maybe other kids are sick. Well, maybe that's not okay anymore. Or even kids that, you know, people at work saying, you know, you know, 
Bob next to you is sick and sneezing, and you know you feel bad saying, Bob, why don't you just not come home and not come to work? Well, you know, they're afraid to burn some time off. Well, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe not at this point say, hey, stay home. And really, you're gonna have to use some personal time because we don't all want to get sick. And I, maybe that awkward moment goes away. I don't know, maybe, right? But a lot going on. A lot of decisions have not been made yet. So, you know, we're working through this. And I, this is what I love about this industry that, you know, we're, we, don't have to have an, we don't have to have the answer right now. And we all recognize that we're working hard to get an answer. Maybe we don't have it available for everyone and it's okay you know i've heard uh, rick dorico say many times we're built we're flying this plane while we're building it so it's kind of cool and i know dave and again thank you dave for uh for partnering with us uh, with transfunded to make sure we we work with you guys and getting these messages out it's exciting we got great panelists here today and i'm going to be talking about a lot of different things here in, in the industry but again i'm extremely honored that we're part of this and I'm always so impressed on a daily basis on what everyone's doing in this industry. I'm excited, of course, these best practices are, are important. Again, we're reinventing what's best practice. I feel like what we talked about six weeks ago, it's already old and it's already, you know, it doesn't even apply anymore. So now we're already thinking about the next thing. So I love about what we're doing with these webinars and I love, and I wanna keep encouraging everyone just to keep pushing and you know, I know you guys are all stepped up and become the leaders where you guys should be, and we knew you were gonna be, so I'm excited. I do wanna do some little reminder. We do have a Stop Finder communication. It's a free product that we're offering to all of our clients and all non-clients of ours. It's a, if you want, if you're informed, if you wanna get more information about this, send an email to freestopfinder at transfinder.com, and I'm sure we'll talk more about it. It's a communication tool. This is the right time to start communicating with parents. Again, we're offering this as a free tool for our clients and really non-clients non either. So that way you can streamline your communication. It's important that now you communicate up-to-date information. Again, everything we talked about six weeks ago, not all of it is actually relevant anymore and it's important. So just wanna make sure you're aware of that. And we're, again, we're excited, but enough of me. We gotta just really uh, get, get moving. We got a lot, lot to cover, again, Dave, thank you again for for partnering with us. We're excited, and uh, here you go, Dave. Uh, let's have a great webinar like we always do. And by the way, one last thing: questions, please send some questions. We're all going to be checking this out. I might pop in in and out and say, "Hey, there's a good one come through from someplace." So we have a good number of attendees from the state of New York, which I'm, I'm always proud of. So thank you, and uh, here you go, Dave. Tony, thank you. Uh, as always, thank you for uh, providing this uh, platform for us to do this. This is the third webinar that NIAPT has been involved in, and we've had great turnout and a uh, uh, significant amount of uh, discussion back and forth. So thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, today, we have a, a great panel assembled. As Tony has said, we're moving on to the next step, right? We're talking about uh, what's it take to reopen uh, our resume our operations so uh, uh, today we've asked uh, uh, some folks to join us Bill Harvey from Honeyoy Falls Lima School District Bill's the transportation director and also the uh, director of security and safety so he brings a lot to the table in terms of the uh, security and safety piece as well too which is huge we've asked Robert Reichenbeck uh, uh, president of the New York State Bus uh, Distributors Association to join us uh, Robert's got some insights on uh, certainly on uh, Long Island because that's where he's uh, he resides in terms of, uh, you know, he, he's right in the mix of it down there as well as, uh, you know, the bus distributor side of the world. Uh, I'd also like to introduce Mike Borges, executive director of the New York ASBO. Uh, Mike stepped in, uh, Christina Coughlin got called out to a meeting and Mike stepped in to uh, uh, participate. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I have to tell you, Mike, I, I'd like to invite you to, uh, you know, at least attend all of these because I think it's important uh, that uh, the school business officials hear, you know, what we've got going on and what we're talking about because obviously it impacts, uh, you know, the business side of the house in a huge way. So uh, I will send you the links and you can, you know, uh, certainly attend these webinars as we do them as your schedule permits. And, you know, thank you for coming on today. So. Uh, Rick DeRico our, uh, from TransFinder will moderate today and uh, he'll kick off the conversation. 
and uh, the rest of us will jump in as uh, as necessary. So, Rick, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for doing Thanks so it. much, David. Thanks so much. This is a great panel, guys. Just so you know, we met about a half hour <laughs> earlier just to get things working, and already the lively conversation. I wish we could have recorded that. It was so good. I know it's going to be even better as we go live here. Um, I wanted to just start off by reading us uh, just a lead to a uh, yesterday's USA Today story that um, was the lead story on um, starting school back up. It starts off like this. Imagine for a moment American children returning to school this fall. The school week looks vastly different with most students attending school two, maybe three days a week and doing the rest of their learning at home. At school, desks are spaced apart to discourage touching. Some classrooms extend into unused gymnasiums, libraries, or art rooms, those spaces that were left vacant while schools put on hold activities that cram lots of children together. Arrival, dismissal, recess happen at staggered schedules and through specific doors to promote physical distancing. Students eat lunch at their desks. Those old enough to switch classes move with the same cohort, cohort every day, or teachers move around while students stay put to discourage mingling with new groups. Teachers and other education staff at higher risk of contracting the virus continue to teach from home while younger or healthier educators teach in person. Everyone washes their hands a lot, frequently touch school surfaces, get wiped down a lot. And then the, the writer puts that that's a description of a potential school day um, that they put together um, after interviews with 20 education leaders determining what a reopened school would look like. So I'm just gonna throw it out to all four of you. First of all, what do you think about that? Um, does that resonate? And um, if something in there doesn't quite line up, give us your thoughts on what you think a reopened school even looks like. Uh, I'll start with you, Bill. Bill, Robert, Mike, and then we'll head over to Dave to close up this section here. Bill, you're on mute, I think. Right off the bat, I mess up, right? Okay. <laughs> well, I, I think that's a very uh, appropriate piece that you let off with, Rick. And uh, those are the exact conversations that um, we've been having within our leadership team at school, right? That, you know, we're, we're here to talk about the busing piece of it, but try to imagine what the school looks like and then how that spills over to the transportation where kids normally all go in and out one door, now they're coming in and out various doors. Um, and the schedules, right? Our drivers, we, we run our AM shift, our PM shift. We get into split schedules or A, A day and B days to reduce the overall building population to facilitate the social distancing. What's that do to transportation? Um, so they're very realistic questions. And even though a lot of them paint the picture of the building, what goes on in the building, there's a spillover, right, to transportation and what we do as a support piece of the education process. I think, uh, thank, thank you for having me as well. Uh, I think this is a great, great opportunity to get everybody's thoughts and opinions. Uh, but I think uh, school, school in the future is going to be changed um, even when there is school start and everything starts back up. How many students are really going to be in class? Uh, parents not letting students or their children attend school. Um, and even if they do, are they being driven or are they taking a bus now? Um, how, how do you probably social distance? It's, it's going to affect everything. It's, um, it, we need guidance. We need guidance. The distributors need guidance from, from NIAP. NIAP needs guidance from the state. The state needs guidance from, from everybody's opinions. It's, it's an ongoing circle. And I think, um, working together, we can all find a solution. Thank you. Michael. Uh, well, currently, you I think, you know, oh, there you go. Uh, we're on uh, business officials are sort of in a holding pattern. Again, like everyone said, we're kind of waiting on guidance uh, from up above. Um, as many of you know that the uh, in the state budget that was adopted, the, the governor and the division of budget were given a lot of leeway in imposing um, additional or future cuts to school aid. Uh, depending on whether there was uh, an excess of expenditures uh, or a drop in revenue. And the first uh, deadline was actually uh, today. So, um, and the 
the controller will be coming out with some um, financial plans, some financial analysis of where the state is, and then um, within 15, 10 days of that, the uh, the governor and the legislature have to agree on what to do next. So our folks are waiting to see what happens next in terms of adopting budgets um, and in cuts that may come down, which will impact not only, um, you know, transportation, but also all, all aspects of school operations. Um, so we're right now focusing on the next four to six weeks and really haven't gotten as far as thinking about reopening next year or uh, in the short term. Uh, I know the, the Board of Regents have just announced creating a reopening task force to take a look at that. So, um, but right now, I think our, our major concern is, you know, what's going to happen in the next 15, 15 days. 15 days. Wow. Okay. Short windows here. Okay, David. Yeah, uh, I, I think, you know, we certainly got to look to see what's going on with this budget. Uh, certainly, uh, that's that's huge. Uh, I think from a school transportation perspective, uh, what I what I envision is going to happen is at some point we're going to get the green light to open schools, and the buses are got to roll, uh, and we're going to have to figure out, you know, how how to do that safely. Uh, complying with any state regulations that happen to come uh, it could be developed and of course you know CDC guidelines and all those kinds of things and it's such a unique problem it's you know we've never been here before and I think the sooner we start talking about this and developing you know our thoughts and putting our thoughts on paper and presenting it to superintendents boards business officials so they can you know uh, uh pick it apart and you know we we always come up with better plans and we all work together and that's why you know this panel is a perfect example of that you know a lot of different perspectives i i think we we have to look at this long term uh and and uh, figure out you know if they pull the trigger tomorrow and we go back to school june 1st or july 1st or september 1st how does it look on a school bus and uh and you know we we think a lot about uh uh, how, how, how are we going to address kids as they come in the front door of the school? But the front door of the school really is going to be the school bus in this scenario because kids are going to get on school buses and, and, and we're going to deal with the same issues on a school bus as you're going to deal with in a school. Uh, so we, we've got to come up with a plan and uh, to keep them safe, keep our drivers safe and uh, uh, continue doing what we do. Do you think that school is going to, I mean, anyone can jump in on this, that school is going to open before the end of the, the actual school year? Um, do you think that there's a possibility that doors will actually open before summer? Uh, we don't think that's likely to happen. I mean, the governor has been talking about regional reopenings based on certain facts, hospitalizations, infection rates, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and he has tied business reopenings to school reopenings. He says uh, repeatedly that you can't really open businesses without reopening schools, uh, particularly, you know, workers who have children, uh, school-aged children. So, um, but the logistics of reopening schools uh, would entail having uh, cl a cleaning plans, disinfectant plans, um, social distancing plans. He's, he said that in various different press conferences. Um, so there, there's a lot of logistical hurdles that would have to be overcome before schools could reopen um, uh, this year, as well as um, over in September. So you think it's unlikely before the end of this uh, school year? Anybody else want to jump in on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in, uh, Rick. I, I think it's it's unlikely across the state. I think regionally, and that's what Michael hit on, is that there's possibilities that regionally maybe some schools might be able to open. Um, based on the circumstances within their area. I know the governor's talked multiple times about the North Country and the rate of infection up there. Um, so we're definitely, if we did open, I, I couldn't see us opening in our area in Central New York, Western New York, until at least um, into June. And then you get into the fact that is that worthwhile or is a benefit worth the gain, right? So. Are, um, is that worth the, the risk, really, of, of infection and things like that? So um, I actually think summer school might be at risk, and we may even only see partial opening with summer school programs. A lot of the students that uh, attend extended school year programs, um, 
based on their needs and their individual circumstances, it might be critically important. Maybe the priority would be more important with some of those students. So um, I wouldn't be surprised to see our summer program only be partial. Okay. Bill, I want to piggyback on something. You you wrote us a note to your staff, at, was it, I don't know, was it today or yesterday? Uh, today, this morning. This morning. And if you don't mind, I'm going to just go through real quickly because there's some good stuff here. And then I want everybody to jump in on it. There's a lot of points, but you can tell that you've been thinking about this a lot. And I'm sure you represent a lot of other people in your position um, that are noodling this stuff and, and what reopening looks like. Um, so you wrote, it's a title of Resuming Operations, School Transportation Considerations. And you wrote, and on the news this morning, I heard that the governor has charged the New York State Education Department with uh, to commission a New York Forward Reopening Advisory Board, a task force focused on what it takes to get schools to open and how. And then you talked about, I need my own task force, which I wanna ask you guys about that idea of creating your own task force. You said, I've been trudging through this alone I've assembled my own top 10 list of talking points. And I believe the next step is to develop two buckets, one filled with what we know now and what we what we can do, and the other filled with tasks based on speculation. And as Tony mentioned in the introduction, you know, some of the things that were four or five weeks ago, those things have already changed. Um, this is not something we should be do that should be we should be doing alone. Um, I have a great and very smart team around me, and we should be tackling this together. You already mentioned that all of you had mentioned the importance of all of us working together on this. So here's a quick uh, rip of your top 10. Uh, number one, safe uh, staff safety and operational guideline changes need to be need to be ensured. Staffing and HR issues, does, every, does everybody come back? Uh, student safety and operational changes. Um, PPE and other issues surrounding that. What, how to use supply chain, cleaning, disinfecting processes, that's been a big issue in uh, many stories and the webinars we've been involved with. Um, school site traffic changes, uh, school loading and unloading, bus capacity, school schedules, and possible temperature scanning and other Department of Health recommendations and guidelines. So that's just a quick top 10 list you put together. So I'm sure you probably could have put together a lot more than that. Um, I wanna jump first on the idea of a task force. You know, we obviously have a statewide task force but is there maybe some value in every school district coming up with their own task force, getting guidance from the state, getting guidance from NIAP and others, and then kind of coming up with a plan that may be revisited, you know, that may have be vetoed, but it may, some aspects of it will still go into effect. Anybody can jump in on that. Yeah, well, I'll- well, there, are, there are two task forces. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead, Mike. I, I just wanted to clarify, there's, there, there's two task forces. One is the, the governor created his reopening uh, task force. Uh, I think it's based on regions. And then, in uh, but there's no K-12 representation on those task forces uh, created by the governor. So in response, the, the Board of Regents uh, has just announced uh, that they are creating a, a reopening task force uh, to come up with a template for school districts to use um, on how to reopen uh, in September or earlier. So there, there are just two different task yeah. forces, one governor, uh, one board of regents, uh, and the board of regents one is, is coming up with a template for schools to utilize. So that way everybody's not recreating the wheel. Right. Yeah, good point. The, um, I think it's important that we, you know, when you, if you think of, the ta of a task force, really it's a leadership group, but, and, and it's our, you know, the varying sizes of operations have varying degrees of resource, a larger district, would have multiple layers of maybe mid-management within the transportation department. Um, in our department, you know, we have uh, a smaller operation where we have a dispatcher and a head driver and a driver trainer, um, 19A people. So, and then possibly bringing in a couple of bus drivers, um, monitors, maybe a mechanic, keeping in mind that there will be protocol and operational changes that we need to uh, deploy to maintain student safety to assure parents that we're maintaining um, a safe, secure, and disinfected environment for their kids every day, um, it's gonna look different. So the more, I think the more we can get people involved, we can get that buy-in from our staff if they had a voice and a seat at the table. Because I know when I saw about the uh, Board of Regents 
um, putting together this uh, K-12 committee and it said that there would be representation from superintendents, parents, teachers, et cetera. And I thought, and I even sent an email to Dave. I said, you know, we need a seat at this table, you know, and then, and it makes you think of, you know, all of all the stakeholders within our transportation departments or our bus distributors or wherever, you know, as an association, um, we need to have a seat at the table to figure out the path forward, right? As a leader, I can develop that top 10 list as a starting point, but then we need to work within our team to bring that forward and, and, and roll it out to our staff. I think, I think um, a task force is definitely needed in, in this type of situation. I mean, you look at the state budget, it provides for student transportation. It's an upwards of $2 billion going to uh, public municipalities and school districts who who utilize it for their transportation. And some of these funds are doled out to, to private contractors um, and operators, um, and as well as being used for their own operation. Um, so there, there is this, this private and this public and private partnership that there needs to be an open line of communication. Um, coming from the distributor side, without, without uh, proper guidance, uh, school districts will be left without knowing what they need or, or help, help planning uh, for their budget when it comes to the school buses. So it's, there needs to be open line communication between everybody. And I think a task force is the best way to do that. Great. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. I'd just like to add, I think that uh, we're certainly going to have to see what uh, state ed comes up with in terms of, uh, you know, uh, regulation or best practices guidance. I think some of this stuff we can assume is going to happen, like the disinfected environment for kids. And I think we can start talking right now about how we would do that on a school bus. Uh, you know, I was noodling around a little bit this morning on the cost of something like that. And if you take a person and, and you're paying that person X amount of dollars and it takes 10, 15 minutes to do a bus, and I don't know that it takes 10 or 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 50 minutes, uh, you're looking at some significant money in a bus fleet to, to uh, clean the bus, disinfect the bus. My assumption is on a daily basis, that's what the governor's telling MTA that he wants done. So I don't assume that'll be any different on one of our school buses. So uh, the question becomes, you know, how do we make that happen? I mean, we can start those conversations right now. Do we, you know, what equipment do we need? You know, what kind of money are we talking about? What kind of times are going to take? What time, when are we going to do it? Uh, we can assume that's probably going to be one of the requirements. And, uh, you know, where are we going to get the money to do it? That's why I invited Mike here today, because he's the money guy. He can, <laughs> he can push for the money. Uh, I'll tell you one uh, thing. We're not going to have uh, as much money as we uh, we would hope. So uh, no, no, we're going to have to do a, a, lot, a lot more with less. <laughs> uh, all the things we're talking about, if, if uh, you know, we have to do this, is going to cost money. So now you have the question. And Bill, we talked about this in the past, and I'm going to throw that out there. Uh, does transportation look the same as it does now? Do we provide the service to the degree that we we provide now? And I think that's a, a big question to ask. Uh, we all know that if a bus doesn't show up at the appointed time, uh, we hear about it. So it's important <laughs> to the community. Uh, the, the question is, is it always going to, to happen? And I wonder what your perspectives is perspectives are on, on on that question. Will we always have the service to the degree that we have it now? Yeah, that's a great question. You guys all want to jump in? Yeah, I think uh, Dave, I think it's going to look different, and it's you know we're we're a needs. I always say we're a needs based service, right? That we we're there to support the educational process, which includes you know academics and athletics, and depending on what degree they need us. I think that when we start back, I don't think there'll be the field trips and some of those activities that result in large groups coming together. Sports is a question mark. Um, but also you have to wonder, you know, we talk about money and, um, you know, would, would distances change, you know, as far as walkout distances, board policies on what levels of services we provide. And also, um, you know, does it change with respect to instead of just automatically rooting everybody, people have to request a ride similar to what they do maybe with private parochial because I know half the people aren't going to ride our bus when we come back. 
four fears or, or an anxiety, um, but I need to know what half those are because that can um, have a serious impact on my operation. Um, and then will it over time go back to, to full? I, I don't know, it's, it's hard to say. I'd be interested to hear what others think as well. I think um, the school bus is a very underrated uh, product. I mean, uh, the general public, it's not something that they think about every single day. They give it that it's a given that every single day a bus is going to show up and pick their students up and drop them off. Um, it doesn't work like that. It, it There needs to be organization from transportation directors, um, members of NIAP, from, from business officials to make sure that these buses can can uh, be purchased and they can roll out when they need to be rolled out. Uh, the distributors are there to provide the services uh, for the districts. And I think um, it's really, it's, it's gonna take, it's gonna take time to, to make sure that everybody is on the same page. That the parents are gonna realize with, without proper organization that the bus isn't gonna show up every day. I want to go through some questions that we got. We do have a list of our own questions. I'm sorry, did someone have yeah. something? Yeah, I just kind of wanted to add on to that. And, I, and I'll say that I'm speaking from experience with our department, but I know this goes for transportation departments all over New York State and the United States. But we enjoy a very high level of confidence and trust with our parents, our customers, right? And I think that, you know, um, Rick, when you read my list, the top things on the list, um, we're staff safety and, and how do we do that? And then student, you know, student safety and the disinfecting and cleaning, those are all in the top part of the bucket. And Dave mentioned some of these things we know we're gonna have to do and we can start working on them now. I, I question, are we gonna clean a bus daily after each run in between AM and PM shifts? I'm envisioning there'll be cleaning in between shifts. And I had a, um, a phone conference this morning with, um, or uh, yesterday with a, a supplier of our cleaning products that we use. And I learned a lot about how much education we need to deliver to our staff. I can't just buy a new product and give it to, to our drivers and say, here, clean the bus. They need to know how to use it, how to properly uh, apply it. And then um, all the training that goes on, we'll have to have somebody else do the actual disinfecting. So right now we're, you know, those are things we, need to do and, and we're going to work on doing the training now before we ever come back together so i think doing that level of work and training and cleaning and disinfecting and protecting ourselves and our students i think that that's how transportation stays alive is earning the trust and the faith of our parents and, and i students. think the there's been with the high demand of cleaning supplies uh districts and individuals have been forced to purchase brands that they're not familiar with and, and they don't research all the way. And it, it's very important that um, with this, no matter what product a district or an individual may use to clean a bus, you have to follow the CDC guidelines. You have to make sure you're cleaning properly. Um, and from our experience as the distributors, we, we don't recommend using bleach uh, on the seats or on the seat belts. Uh, many, may, many of you may know, uh, it will deteriorate seat belts. It will deteriorate seating. Um, so using direct bleach is not recommended. And for everything else, uh, if you have questions, you, I think it, it, it's very, very prominent that you ask your, your local dealer and your distributor about what cleaning supplies, if you have questions about them to use. Robert, do you have a list that we could put on our best practices page? Because that is, that what you just said is so insightful. Um, I will have that, we'll put that on. for you uh, and send it out and we can send it oh. out to everybody. Yeah, that is so insightful. You know, we got a comment from Alfred who says, it's it's not a question, but he says, even if the governor opens up school reg regionally, we are nowhere near prepared to implement transportation plans because we don't have the PPE and cleaning supplies to meet the requirements for disinfecting buses. We need more time to procure these hard to get items, the supply, chain is still broken. Do you agree with that? Are there ways around this to, you know, that you can, you know, supplement? Thoughts on that? I think that varies, uh, Rick, depending on the area. I know I can speak for our district that we, we have enough, you know, I think of PPE as being gloves, masks, 
uh, hand sanitizer, cleaners, um, and we have, you know, we have enough that we could start um, at our school. What we're look, putting together now is an order to take us through 10 weeks, like in September. So, and I would, uh, R Robert brought this up that, you know, the cleaning materials uh, and supplies are not readily available. So you need to be anticipating what you're gonna need for a September start, which we, I think would all agree that's most likely when it would be and get your order in now so that uh, you wait till August, you'll never get it in time to start. Good, any other thoughts on that? You know, there's a lot of questions we're getting on school bus drivers. One mentions um, that the bulk of her drivers, let me get Mary Ann says, are older drivers gonna be allowed to drive? That's a majority of our staff. Um, somebody else mentions just concern about the safety of drivers. Um, that um, and then another person mentions um, drivers being trained to be the ones to do the disinfecting of the buses daily. So just I know it's a couple of different questions, but you know, are older drivers going to be recommended not to be driving um, for a period of time? Do you see uh, the you know, changes? I, I, I haven't heard I haven't heard that, Rick. But I can tell you on many of the webinars that I've been on with a lot of chapters and talking to a lot of uh, folks across the state. There's a real concern that the drivers who are in the risk pools over 65, high blood pressure, hypertension, uh, those kinds of things that put them in that risk, risk pool may choose not to come back. They may choose not to put themselves in harm's way, so to speak. And it's a real concern among uh, uh, many of our school districts because if, uh, I'll give you an example, one, one district I talked to, the director said 10% uh, of my people are in that uh, risk pool. So if we lost 10% of the drivers across the state and our responsibility to transport kids continues at the current levels, we're in trouble because we were short of drivers going into this. Right, right. So uh, that's a real concern. Uh, the disqualification is less of a concern to me, quite honestly, than just drivers saying, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. Personally, checking out, okay. Yeah. Any, anybody yeah. else? I had heard talk about that, and I can't remember where. I think it was in a conversation um, with our district leadership team that somebody had had heard that there was talk of limiting the age of of the drivers just because they're in a high risk pool. And you know, we yeah. we have an older workforce. A lot of our folks are retired. I kind of this, using the bus driving as a as a a bridge to their bridge career to their actual retirement. So, but I think either way, Dave hit the nail on the head that we've got a lot of staff that know that they're in a high risk group and when you look at a part-time job and for what they make you know that it'll be it'll make the decision hard for them to come back because they know the level of risk that they're putting themselves and their families their spouses into um i would say as far as the cleaning uh rick we did a we had a call in the rush area with our directors um either yesterday or day before talking about the same type of thing and a couple of the directors had mentioned that they have their mechanics trained to do the cleaning. Um, you can do general cleaning, but you know if you have 50 drivers or 100 drivers, however many, and you set one standard for cleaning, you know, you're, you're gonna have people hit the mark, you're gonna have people go above the mark, and you're gonna have people fall way below the mark. Right. Our obligation here is gonna be to make sure that we hit the mark, you know, each and every day with our cleaning and disinfecting. So. I almost see that as a twofold. I see um, some general cleaning being done by the regular driver, and then people that maybe have a higher degree of training that will be uh, doing the disinfecting. And uh, so I, I kind of see that there is training for both, for whoever's gonna do the disinfecting and for the general cleaning. Great. I know we have our Western New York, uh, the, uh, the Buffalo Teachers Union was, uh, the head of the Buffalo Teachers Union was questioning whether uh, you know his staff or his members would want to come back to work unless the school district could guarantee their safety and health. So um, you're going to see pushback by labor unions as to whether um, they would come back to work even if schools dis school districts reopened, if the school districts couldn't guarantee a certain amount of safety and you know preventative gear and all that kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of moving parts uh, on, on whether okay. schools reopen or not. Robert, so one thing that you, well, I, I think, um, I mean, school buses still remain the safest way to get to and from to and from school. Uh, and I think 
as long as drivers, transportation directors, organizations that operate buses, uh, school districts, they maintain proper guidelines, proper sanitization, proper disinfecting. I think um, it might be a while until we go back to 100% normal the way it was three or four months ago. But I do think uh, the school bus will be still be maintained to be the safest way to get to and from school. David? I, I was just going to add that I, uh, to Mike's point and Robert's, I guess, I, I, I think we have to assure our drivers that we're doing everything we can to make the environment safe. And that's going to mean uh, protective PPEs. That's going to mean disinfecting. That's going to be looking at load levels uh, to keep kids and drivers safe. Uh, and, and maybe going overboard a little bit to assure them that, uh, you know, we're going to do everything we can to make it a safe environment for you to come back to work because uh, many of our drivers uh, aren't career people. As Bill said, some of them, it's something to do until you really retire. Whereas, you know, teachers, they're career people. You know, they're, they're gonna not want to interrupt their career. But if I'm a person who's retired and I'm making enough money, you know, making some extra money to pay my car payment or take a trip, this may not be worth it anymore. And again, if we lose 10% of our people, I think we're in trouble uh, if, if, if the, if we continue to provide the services we were providing before we went into this COVID pa uh, pandemic situation. Um, yeah. Going to the... Could I add on. to that? Please. I think, Dave, you were talking about making sure that the, you know, our staff knows that we're doing everything possible and provided them all the tools to do the job and do it safely and protect their own health and safety. And I think the, the tricky thing that we all need to be aware of uh, um, is if you take on a scale of one to 10, 10 people are very scared of the, of the disease. One, people are very lackadaisical about it. Um, yeah. When we bring our staff in, we're really gonna have to look at how they interact, whether they even come in the driver's room, because you're gonna have somebody who's a 10 on the scale and somebody else who's a two or a three, and that's gonna end up in your <laughs> office because they're, the the 10's gonna come in and say, yeah. I can't work here because that guy's not wearing his mask. I haven't seen him wash his hands all day. That so there's an HR piece of it, and that's where the confidence comes yeah. in in the protocols and the training. Right, right, right. Communication. Um, communication. That's we talk about that all the time. That in a crisis, especially, yeah. you cannot over communicate. Um, you really can't. Um, I'm. I want to just say something real quickly, and then get follow up on a, on a bus driver question. Um, but. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what the school day may look like in terms of two tiers or three tiers and that kind of thing. Um, and one, uh, Denise mentioned that, you know, just cleaning the bus, um, if there are two or three tiers in the schedule, there may not even be enough time. Her question is, would there be enough time to properly clean a bus, you know, between tiers even? So just more things to think about. Um, the question that um, William asks is, you know, how does the district compensate for those drivers that don't feel safe to return to work? Because they, because many of the drivers are in that high risk category, as you already mentioned. Any thoughts on that? Comp compensating drivers that don't want to return right this season? I guess I, I would say that I think, and, and having dealt with this a little bit right now, um, you know, we're out delivering uh, meals and supporting the distribution of uh, some 700 meals a day to our community and a couple different distribution locations. But really, if a driver, if somebody doesn't feel comfortable coming in uh, to do that work as assigned, they're using their accruals um, to cover that. So um, I think it'll be a very similar situation when somebody, when school opens back up, if a driver doesn't want to come back, doesn't feel they can safely come back and they don't have accruals to cover the absence or a doctor's note, I think that um, they have a decision to make. I think it's gonna be hard for us to continue to pay people to stay home um, when they're right. not able to perform their duties. Dave, Dave, did you... I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't know if Dave had any thoughts on that or what he might've heard. Uh, no, I, I haven't really uh, had a lot of feedback uh, on that, but I would agree that at some point, uh, you have to make a decision if this isn't the job for me and and i guess to my point that i made earlier i'm i'm pretty confident some people will say that that uh yeah i don't think i want to do this work because you know because the nature of the work 
I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to protect my health. And I think as an industry, we have to think about that in, uh, you know, what's our, what's our, uh, our uh, plan? Uh, you know, do we, do we uh, tell our community that, hey, we may be short of drivers, so there may be uh, delays. Uh, do we set up our routing to cover that somehow? Uh, uh, if we go to split sessions, how does that impact? Do we need more drivers? Uh, you know, I, I think that's going to be an issue, uh, keeping yeah. enough horsepower to be able to bring the kids to and from. And and I've heard, that talk that if ahead, we went, I've heard that talk that if we went to split sessions, the drivers, you know, might be driving, you know, all throughout the day, you know, maybe 10 hours. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing that you have to, we have drivers that don't want to drive all day long. You know, if they wanted to work all day, you know, the retirees are like, look at I'm that doesn't fit my schedule or it's more than I want to do. So um, then we'll get into those labor issues of, of whether or not people are, are willing and able to do the work. So I'm sorry, go ahead, Rick. No, oh, no, that I was what I was thinking about because I thought there was right. about um, uh, drivers not working enough and that they'd rather go from run to run to run and stay busy throughout a certain period of time. No, is that, I think it depends on the driver and it depends on the workforce. Um, I know in, in our particular area, all across uh, the Monroe Rochester region, we have a very hard time getting drivers to do extra trips before all this happened. People are very content to come in and do their morning and afternoon runs. Now, if you get into some other areas of the state where people are trying to, you know, do this more as a, a career, you know, people may welcome that sort of opportunity for the extra hours. Okay. I think we also have to get beyond the current mindset in terms of the labor pool. Um, you know, just the numbers today, another three or four million Americans filed for unemployment insurance. So there's currently about 30 million Americans without jobs. Um, I don't think those 30 million will have jobs come September. So even if your current bus driver workforce is unwilling or unable to come back to work uh, because of the risks. There is going to be a larger pool to choose from uh, of Americans or New Yorkers in particular who would be looking for a job. Um, but yeah, it's not going to be business as usual come September. You're probably going to look at staggered routes and staggered schedules. Um, and so I think there's a lot of there's going to be a lot of give and take in terms of uh, how we continue to operate um, under the new under the new normal. The only thing I would say to that is, while you're saying there may be a pool of, of potential employees that are not going back to work or eligible to drive a school bus because drivers don't want to come back, there's going to be a time, not all of them have CDLs, not all of them are certified to drive a school bus. It's going to take time for people to have the, or potential employees that are not school bus drivers that want to make the jump into the, these new openings to be certified to do so. It, it, you can't just walk onto a bus and say, I want to drive 66 or 70, 72 kids down the road. It, it, it's, it, it will take some time. Yeah, I, I hope to that point. I, I hope, uh, Mike, I hope you're doing that because we've always looked in the past and said when the unemployment rate is high, uh, we, we could get bus drivers and, and with the unemployment very low, we've struggled. But I think the CDL requirements have changed that a little bit. Uh, it's very difficult to get a CDL license now. And to compound that, in New York, they've closed all of the DMV offices. So uh, until they open those offices up and, and Any let people us do road that. testing. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a problem. We, we've asked the commissioner to open up uh, road test sites or not it'll happen I, I soon i i don't know uh, i hope it does because uh, there's there's a backlog out there uh one of our members from long island said they do a thousand uh driver driver tests between january and september every year so uh that, that that's problematic so laurianne asked a question it's for you robert um and says um wants to know if the bus guys that's her term uh, are looking at sneeze guards um, added to the buses, and also if you're aware of any other changes um, 
to what buses look like inside I'm adding that part um so there i think we've mentioned this earlier that uh there are talks about it um the potential is there um particularly on commercial vehicles uh new york state has said that a sneeze guard is allowable there are questions when it comes to school buses um they will have to be fabricated they will have to be dot approved and we need to wait for guidance from D new york state dot um parts will have to be fabricated and we're happy to work with with dot NIAP, uh the school districts any outside vendors um that that have questions um but when it comes to uh actual sneeze guards being put in you'd have to contact your local distributor and get their opinion about how what the best way to go about inserting one is especially with with dot pending approval here's a comment from paul it's not a question but if you want to jump in um Bill, Could I add? Add? yeah just to add on that robert i think one of the things that uh somebody mentioned i don't know if dave mentioned it or but I, I think uh, air turnover, one of, one of my concerns, and I, because of the driver shortage, I drive bus a lot, but it's amazing how stagnant the air gets inside a bus. And when you think about a, you know, health and safety, um, and, and especially given the pandemic, I think it, time that we figure out a way, and that you know, we have to go back to manufacturers with that, but you know, how can we get an air changeover on a bus um it uh, intervals more similar to you know a classroom setting i know in classrooms we can we can electronically adjust the air flows in our building so we're changing over the air in a room so many times in an hour um so that's just something to think about that the the airflow on a bus and, and getting so every cabin air changed out every uh every manufacturer every school bus uh each manufacturer builds their bus slightly different uh the some have fans some have vents some have uh many buses particularly in new york city they have they all have air conditioning in the city mm -hmm. uh so that is an option that that is available uh but like i said earlier if you talk to uh your local air distributor uh they they would definitely be able to point out the best ways to improve circulation improve vent uh vent and airflow for you if that is a question you may have about your bus yeah, good. Thank you. Jim mentioned something I just want to throw out there, and then I want to read something from uh, Paul. Dis uh, Paul, Jim mentions that districts should contact their insurance company, uh, risk management reps, or BOCES health and safety reps for help with cleaning disinfecting protocols. That makes sense. Everyone mm -hmm. agree with that? Yep. There may be a uh, resource there. Uh, and then um, Paul says, uh, I remember, and I'll, this is really for Robert, but anyone else can jump in. I remember once hearing that buses were designed not to be conducive to bacteria, germs, etc. The CRES handrails, for example, and the material that the seats are made with, uh, we're not going to kill every germ. This is Paul speaking. We're not going to kill every germ on the bus. I hope we don't go off the deep end with the disinfecting plans. The cell phones that the students carry on the bus probably have more bacteria than the bus itself. In fact, my wife uh, is a very big, I don't know if I can say germaphobe, but she's very, she's an RN, and we have what they call, it's called soap foam, uh, phone soap, I guess. It's, it looks like a tanning bed for my cell phone. And you pop it in for 10 minutes, and then it kills the germs, and now every time, you know, every day we put it in there. Um, so any thoughts on that, you know, going off the deep end? Uh, is it part of it is just appearances as well, that was just letting people... The, the more the time goes on, the more the time goes on, the more students you have in the bus, the bus is just naturally going to attract dirt, dust and uh, sand and, and dirt. Uh, it's not to say the bus is unusable. It, it's it's going to have natural wear. Uh, there are methods to clean. CDC has given out disinfecting and sanitizing uh, suggestions. There are there are materials out there uh if you don't if you don't feel comfortable doing a hand scrub of of a vehicle there are there are other technologies out there that are available such as uh static cleaning where you don't cover 99.9 .9 of a surface as opposed to a, so, a soap and rag um so there are there are 
technologies out there available to clean effectively. Yeah, and I, I guess to add, I, to add on that, Robert, I would say that if we we're all really honest with ourselves, we would admit that this is an area where we could improve anyway. Um, I have some drivers that, again, I sub drive, I'll get on a bus and it smells clean, it feels clean. It's just, uh, you can tell the driver really keeps the bus clean. Then you get in other ones, not so clean, right? And I have friends that drive charter bus, coach bus um, on the side, and also a friend that owned a coach bus business. But when those buses come back, before they go out on another job, they get thoroughly cleaned. Um, and that's something that we've never done and, and kind of on my hit list over the past year anyway to tighten up that part of our operation. And I think this is a good opportunity to do so. Robert kind of you alluded know, I, to I, that. I just want to weigh in on that a little bit. And, and I, I, I'm not too far away from what Paul said in terms of agreeing, but it really makes no difference what we think. It comes down to the parents in our community and we deliver a service and unless we can convince them that bus is safe, they're not going to use it. And, 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 there's, going to be put, and, and there's going to be pushback. It's similar to the seatbelt argument. You know, we've for years uh, opposed seatbelts on school buses and now uh, the, our, our, our communities, the people we serve are saying, we don't want to hear that. We want seatbelts on school buses, three-point belts on buses. And I think it's the same analogy here that it's going to come down to our communities saying, what does the safe bus look like? Is it disinfected? Is it clean? Can I put my kids on it to entrust that you get them to school safely and healthy? And, uh, and I, I think that's the bottom line. Um, Lori Ann, you just said, she said, your parents just want to know that we are doing things to safeguard our students. So, um, so, David, this is a question for you, uh, but anyone else can jump in as well. Um, you know, what, what, this is from Joseph, what do you see our role of transporting students evolving to or changing to? And I'm going to add a little caveat to this. I think Robert kind of alluded to this. Is this a new temporary normal that will eventually go back to the, the way things were in a year or two, or are things you know, forever changed in some form or you know, maybe so, but basically where do you see the role of transporting students evolving to? Um, and that's for you first, David, but then anybody else who wants to jump on. Well, I think we have to look at this in the short and the long term. The short term is, you know, we have to do some things to get uh, kids back to school. Uh, kids uh, do better in school if they have a bus ride to school, that's a fact. Uh, we all know that uh, there's there's facts to support that kids who uh, don't have a, a school bus ride to school tend not to show up. So we're I, I would hope we're always going to be there. Plus the fact the bus rides the safest way to get to and from school. Uh, so I think we've got to preserve this industry and uh, short run. We've got to, uh, you know, address the fears of uh, the coronavirus, clean up our buses, uh, protect our drivers, uh, you know, uh, respond to the concerns out there. Uh, all within, you know, the money we have to spend, which is going to be a big problem, uh, obviously. Uh, but long term, I, I see us coming out of this better. I mean, I, I would tell you that in my 30 something years of doing this, anytime we run into a situation uh, where, where we've been challenged, the industry has come out better than one it went in. And, and I think great. we'll do the same here. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, we'll, we'll find ways to, uh, give a better service uh, than, than when we started. That's awesome. Well, look, at, we're quickly running out of time. I'm going to ask all of you, I'm going to go Michael, Robert, Bill, and then David, and I'm going to ask Tony to come back out at the end um, to give a short takeaway. Will people leave here going back to work, maybe going back to see a, a you know, superintendent or a leader or a parent or whatever? Mm -hmm. What's the one thing that you'd want them to take away from the conversation we just had? <laughs> and again, I'll start with Michael. Well, I think everybody's doing a, a fabulous job under the circumstances. Uh, you know, we're under extraordinary, you know, uh, pressure and stress, and I think people are rising to the occasion and, and helping out in any way they can. And it's it's really gratifying to see how um, the school districts and the BOCES are coming together and serving their students, serving their staffs and their communities. And it's it's really um, heartwarming to see 
um, that kind of activity and that kind of um, uh, outreach uh, being done during the, the, these difficult times. So it's 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 gratifying to be part of the business, the school business community, and and, and school districts in general. All right. Thank you, Robert. Um, the the uh, I'm sorry. You're talking to me, right, Robert? Yeah. One okay. bigger takeaway. So, and from the distributor aspect, um, we're not the experts in school reopenings. Uh, what we're here for is to be in partner with NIAP and, and to be the trusted advisors when it comes to the procurement of new school buses for parts or for service to keep your fleet up and running. That's what we're here for. We're here to support you. Um, and every district has handled coronavirus differently. Every distributor and every dealer has handled it differently. Um, but we all have the same interest is that as long as there's an open line of communication between all parties that are involved into reopening school, the startup will be a lot easier. Um, and that's I think that's what the end goal is for everyone is to have a seamless reopening as opposed to uh, having being one day or two days in and chaos is arising. We want to make sure that there's a plan ahead and that the distributors are here to support up everybody's needs. That's great. Thank you, Robert. Bill. Well, I start by uh, quoting my superintendent of schools. He always says, stay calm and work the problem. And work the problem is what, what we're doing. And, I, and, and you think back to the beginning of this hour when Tony in his opening remarks said that we're in a very different place today than we were six weeks ago. Six weeks ago, I think a lot of us were overwhelmed. We didn't know. Uh, it was just a very unsettled feeling. Then we began to do what we do, and now we're beginning to look down the road to get ready to go back to what we really do, and that's move students. So I would encourage you, uh, you know, Rick read off like my 10 top, top 10 hit list discussion points, but create your own. And if you can begin to put them in buckets, that this is something I can work on now. I can go buy masks, I can train my people on cleaner. So do that. And then the stuff that's unknown, you can work on that. But the object is to get the unknowns over into the bucket of knowns and then check them off the list. So stay That's calm. Great. Stay That's calm. great. I like that. I think we need to hear that. Stay calm. Mm -hmm. And David. Yep. I, I will say what I said on the very first one, uh, school transportation people figure out these problems and uh, we come out up the other side better than we went in. And I'm confident we'll do that. We've proven that this year with, you know, delivering food and keeping operations running and, uh, dealing with all the uh, the issues that have come up. Uh, when we're called upon to open schools and run school buses, we'll do it. I'm confident of that. And uh, But I think we need to work together, partner with all of our, uh, you know, uh, industry and, uh, uh, and and figure this out. And, and we will. I'm very confident of that. Uh, so as, as Bill says, stay calm. We'll be good. Keep that laser focus. That's it. Tony, take away. Guys, I'll tell you, I want to just reemphasize a lot of things you've all said. You, this industry are made up of people that are problem solvers. That's what you guys do. You, you've solved problems. And uh, yeah, you've had some, this was a sucker punch to everybody, of course. We know this. And uh, But you guys solved the problem. I just want, to, just want to give you guys a lot of credit to think about things. And you are staying calm. I mean, the majority of people we talk to, they're calm and they're just they're some of them are looking for directions and some are given directions. It's really there's two buckets and it's okay. You know, the doesn't matter which bucket you're in. We know that the leaders stand out. They didn't they didn't just wake up one morning and say, I'm gonna be the leader today. It just you happen to be that person. And it's okay. We need both types. But I'm gonna just give you one little story. Because I love stories. Um my family moved here from Italy when I was a little kid, but and we lived on a farm and uh I always talk about this story because, you know, we'd have you know, family members come from the north. And by the way, that's the north where they had major problems, of course, in Italy. They would come to the south. I remember my mom would actually talk about the story that, you know, my second cousin would come. They would really well dressed. We were on a farm. We were dressed to be in a farm. And so I remember my mom would always talk about this, that my second cousins would actually show up. And, you know, and my mom would tell their moms, like, you know, the kid's going to get dirty. You probably should not get such nice clothes for them. You know, change the clothes. Like my mom is Josephine. Her mom is, you know, she would say, Josephine, you have no idea how fortunate your son and your daughter is that they live on a farm 
they're, they're getting this earth stuff. They're getting this stuff, and it's healthy for them. Again, you know, I'll never think about what that means. You know, sometimes, you know, obviously this is a completely different story, but sometimes we do need some, you know, these germs. Going to Chuck E. Cheese, are you kidding me? Of course, we all like, oh my gosh. But we grew up with this stuff. And so I wonder there's going to be some studies in 20 years from now that these kids are going to be super clean. Does that mean we're going to have different situation, right? Again, we can't just make one thing change everything. One person had a, a shoe bomber, now I take on my shoes all the time, right? I think you guys are leaders. You know what to do about it, right? And I, I, I challenge you guys, don't make the new norm become forever. This is going to be short term. This is going to be short term. Right, and obviously, by you guys, you paid like ninety dollars for three years. And by the way, my MX covers it. I now have the TSA approved. And I don't take off my shoes. So ninety dollars using my MX, which then it comes out to be zero dollars. I don't have to take off my shoes. So therefore, it actually cost me nothing. So clearly, that shoe thing, TSA approved, is a way to do it. And uh, and that's how you do it. So guys, I don't want you to panic. You know, you're not panicking. It's short term. But meanwhile. You guys are problem solving. I I personally have faith in you guys. You can solve these problems. I know it. So uh, thank, you. thank you so much, guys. Thank, thank you, you very so much, Tony. And I just thank want to thank you. again, Rob. I want to thank our panelists again, Robert, Mike, Bill, and David. David, I just want to thank you for your leadership and for NIAF's leadership. Um, I want to thank everybody who attended. A lot of great questions. Uh, we will be sending out the questions to the panelists so that you could address those if we didn't get to them. And we'll have those on our best practices page, as well as this webinar will be on our best practices page, which you can find off of our homepage at transfinder.com. Lastly, I just want to say that um, if you who are listening have a story of how you have served your community, um, it may make its way into a um, either a, a white paper or a webinar um, down the road. So please email it at mystory at transfinder.com, your story, and we'll follow up with you because we do want to gather as many stories as we can we can learn from each other i think you all have said that we do learn from each other um so anyway i just want to thank everybody again for coming and i just hope you have a great rest of your day thank you okay. great thank, day, you. Thank, thank you thank you thank you all Happy next week. bye bye Take care, Dave.